All right, so last time we looked at the operating regions of a diode, and we're going to be coming back and talking about the breakdown region later on because that's going to turn out to be very, very important. But for now, we're going to look at analysis of diodes assuming they're in forward bias. So in this case, we are concerned about analysis with actual physical non-ideal PN diodes using the PN diode equation. So no longer any ideal diodes. Let's draw a circuit like this. Okay, so here we have a circuit where I want to forward bias the diode. So I'm going to increase Vs to some positive voltage to the point where it turns this diode on. You, we've actually looked at this circuit before, drawn a little differently, but we've seen this circuit before. Okay, now, if Vd is a positive voltage, In other words, that means if the source voltage is also positive, then the diode will be forward biased. And therefore, We apply this approximation. If we assume VD is sufficiently large, as we saw before, we ignore the minus one term because it's small. So here's equation one. Now I'm going to write a KVL equation around this loop. Vs, voltage rise is equal to drop plus drop, KVL, 2112. I'm going to call that equation number two. Now, if I want to find ID and VD, if I want to find the voltage and the current for this diode, obviously, first of all, I need to have some values for N and for IS and for R. I can supply those but I've got two equations and two unknowns. I'm going to have to solve these simultaneously. There's only one problem with solving these equations, doing a simultaneous solve of these equations. What is the problem? Very straightforward mathematical issue. What do, what do simultaneous equation solvers that you guys have done before, what do they always assume? Linearity. Is that a linear equation, exponential equation? No, nope, it's not linear. So I mean, I just can't do substitute and solve like you could with a set of linear equations. I mean, that's something you guys have been doing for ages. You've been doing it in 2112 using Mathematica. So the problem is, this is a nonlinear system because of the behavior of that diode. So, due to this nonlinear exponential term, standard linear techniques will not work. We have to instead solve this 
iteratively using numerical techniques. Now what I'm going to show you guys is a standard numerical technique that is literally hundreds of years old. It is in fact so old that it is actually named after Isaac Newton. Okay, some of these techniques, they go back that far. So before the computers, we had to do this by hand, but it enabled people to solve nonlinear equations. Nowadays, computers do it. In fact, LT Spice uses numerical techniques like the one I'm going to show you in order to solve whenever you're doing an LT, a, 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 an LT Spice problem. So simulations all work on this idea. But I want to show you guys how it works so you understand what is under the hood of LT Spice. What is it that LT Spice is doing? Well, it's doing this. So let's go through and let's kind of work this problem here. I'm going to put some values in here. So in this case, Let's let Vs be equal to 10 volts. Let's let R equal to 10 kilo ohms. Let's assume that Is is 1 femtoampere for our saturation current. And let's also assume that N is equal to 1 and Vt is equal to 25 millivolts. All right, so given these, I want to find the exact values of VD and ID. Okay, let's, let's work this in an iterative manner. And once again, like I said, this is a numerical technique that is easily done with computers, with modern computers. But in this case, we're just going to do it by hand. We first begin by assuming a starting value for VD. So we're going to start someplace by picking a point. If I know that diode is turned on, it's forward biased, what is a reasonable number for VD? 0.6, or in this case, I'm going to say 0.7. Okay, but yeah, either one of those would be a reasonable starting point. I'm going to assume 0.7. Alright, now given this, I'm now going to plug that into the KVL equation and I'm going to solve. So in this case, what I'm going to get is that ID so taking that KVL equation, I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to say that ID is equal to Vs minus Vd divided by R. So given 10 volts and 0.7 and R is equal to 10K, I plug those numbers in. And that's equal to 930 microamps. Now, given this, Now I'm going to use ID to find VD. And in order to do that, I'm going to rewrite equation number one. I'm not going to use the exponential term. I'm going to use the log form. So I'm going to rewrite it like so. All right. What you're going to find, guys, is when you do this iterative analysis, you have to use the log form, not the exponential form. If you try to use the exponential form, it blows up because you're trying to make it converge, but if you do the exponential, it diverges. So in order to get convergence, we use this form.
And once again, the deep mathematical details of divergence and convergence for numerical analysis is beyond this course. There are some great math courses here at Vanderbilt University you can take that cover some of this, and I highly recommend them. But for here, we're going to use this form. And now we're going to plug ID into this equation. We've got all the other terms, including IS, and we can recalculate. So in this case, what we get is VD is equal to 25 millivolts times the natural log of 930 microamps divided by 1 femtoampere, which is equal to 0 0.689 volts. What do I do next? I iterate. I go around. So now that I've done this, let's take this and plug this back into this equation. So in this case, I'm going to take this, plug it back into this equation, and then recalculate. And if I do that, what I'm going to get is that ID is equal to 931.1 microamps. Now I take this result and now calculate VD. So in this case, now I take it and I now plug it back into this equation. And if I do that, what I will get is that VD is equal to 0 0.689 volts. Okay. Do I need to go any further? No, I have converged to a solution. I could run this through one more time, but I get exactly the same thing. VD is 0.689 and ID is 931.1 microamps. So I could, I could of course, in, you know, go to more and more degrees of precision, more significant figures. But as you can see here, very quickly you get to a solution. And typically when you iterate like this, normally you don't need more than two, typically three iterations to get to a final solution. So this is a very effective technique. It works. And variations of numerical techniques like this, have, as I said, have literally been used for hundreds of years. So from this, we've now converged to our final values. And so therefore, VD is equal to 0 0.689 volts and ID is equal to 931.1 microamps. And there's our solution. So all you have to do is run this cycle a couple of times using the correct equation from the circuit until you converge on a solution. And you will know you're in trouble if you use the exponential term because the numbers get bigger and bigger every cycle. It blows up. But if you, do, if you use the log form, then it quickly converges. Now, this is not something we're going to be doing a whole lot of in the class this semester because, first of all, as you can see, it's tedious. 
Okay. Secondly, if I have a more complex circuit with multiple diodes, it becomes very messy very quickly. Now, LT Spice, of course, handles this sort of stuff beautifully. Computers are great for this type of calculation. But I did want you guys to at least see for yourselves how this technique works. And I think there is actually a homework problem or two where the book wants you to kind of go through and see for yourself how this needs to be done if you're going to do it by hand. So we can all be thankful that modern computers exist. It saves us from this. But having said that, numerical analysis of nonlinear equations is still a significant research area even today because people are always looking for ways to take large nonlinear systems and to simulate them as quickly and as effectively as possible. And so that is still a significant area of research in data science. So if you have an interest in this, there's a lot of work always being done in stuff like this. But we are, well, once again, that's kind of beyond the scope of this course. Okay? Now, just want to also mention along with this that you could even solve this graphically if you wanted to. Here is another technique which is very much outdated, but which, you know, a hundred years ago people would do things like this. You could do a graphical solution where you would plot those two equations and look for the intersection of those two equations. So you do something like this. So first of all, I'm going to plot, in effect, a load line here, or a linear connection between two points on, this, on the two axes here. Let me draw this a little bit straighter. So the idea behind this line I just drew is this. So Vs is equal to Id times R plus VD, if I assume VD is equal to zero, then in that case, ID is just equal to VS over R. On the other hand, if ID is equal to zero, then VD is equal to VS. So I plot this line between two points where the diode voltage is zero and the diode current is zero. And I just draw a straight line. So in effect, what I'm doing here is I'm plotting all possible combinations linearly that I can get out of that KVL equation. And then on top of that, I'm going to do my diode equation. And I plot that. So that's the second equation. The intersection of these two lines is my VD versus ID. So you can actually do these kinds of solutions in a literally graphical format if you wanted to. And again, it all comes down to how carefully you can draw the curves and how accurate you want to be when you draw them. But this used to be, once again, a very valid way to solve these types of problems before we had modern computing systems. So a little bit of history here, and the book kind of talks about this a little bit. So I just wanted to throw this out. But again, this is not a practical way to solve problems. Certainly, we're not going to use this technique in this class. Now, ideal diodes are not realistic. And this is entirely too tedious to use if we're going to go through and work these types of problems in this class. So the question is, is, is there 
some compromise? Is there some intermediate way that we can think of to analyze diode circuits without going to all this computational effort, but at the same time getting a reasonable amount of accuracy, something that's more accurate, for example, than an ideal diode? Well, exactly. There is, in fact, exactly a way to do this. For most of this semester, we are going to be using a shortcut method, not only for BJ, for not only for diodes, but also for BJTs. What we want to do is we want to trade off accuracy for speed of computation. So I want to do something that I can do quickly, which is reasonably accurate, not perfectly accurate, but reasonably accurate. So what I'm going to do is something that's called the constant voltage drop model. Or as you will see me abbreviate it, and the book will abbreviate it, the, the CVD model. And here's how it works. And we're going to be looking at this strictly in forward bias, because this, is what, this matters when the diode is on. And we know from looking at ID versus VD, we know we get this exponential behavior. And we know that, as we talked about before, there is a turn on voltage, right? V sub F, a cut in voltage, as we called it before, where we start to see a significant amount of current flowing through the diode. Well, I'm going to make this a little bit simpler. What I'm going to do instead is this. I'm going to take this and I'm going to assume my diode behaves like this. That's my constant voltage drop behavior. And it looks very much like the ideal diode. It, the diode is off until it gets to a certain threshold. But in this case, the threshold's not zero. In this case, the threshold's going to be some turn on voltage that I'm going to specify. And then any amount of current can flow through the diode. So this actual curve versus CVD, this gives us a reasonable approximation, a reasonable trade-off versus the difficulty of actually doing that nonlinear analysis. And normally, the typical CVD approximation we're going to use is that we're going to assume this turn-on point is about 0.7 volts. CVD approximation, when VD is 0.7 volts, the diode is on. If VD is less than 0.7 volts, the diode is off, and ID is equal to zero. And up here, of course, ID can be a positive value. Well. It's not perfect. It's certainly not exact, but it turns out it's a reasonable first order approximation. So we can kind of think of the CVD model in this way. It 
instead of a standard PN diode where we have to explicitly go through and do the calculation using the diode equation, instead we're going to do this. We're going to assume that a CVD model looks kind of like this. It behaves like an ideal diode model connected in series with a 0.7 volt DC offset. So we're simply taking the ideal model and putting an offset in front of it, or connecting it in series. Okay. The CVD model is, for most circuit analysis, a very reasonable first order approximation. In fact, quite often, the CVD approximation will give you an answer that is correct within a few percent of the actual exact value. So, let's work an example. And it's a very familiar example because we just did it. So that's the same circuit we just solved, and we got this iterative exact solution a minute ago. Let's now solve this using the CVD approximation. According to the constant voltage drop solution, if this diode is on, VD is 0.7 volts. What is ID? Now I use that same KVL equation I did a minute ago. And ID will be equal to 930 microamps. So very quickly, I solve that. How close are those numbers to those numbers? Pretty close, right? I mean, if we look at this, if I just do, for example, the percentage error for VD, that's equal to 0.7 minus 0 0.689 divided by 0 0.689 times 100%, and that will be equal to 1.6% error. That's not bad. 1% error is not bad at all, especially for a hand calculation. And in fact, what you'll typically find is usually CVD will get you within 5% with just a first order cut without doing anything special. So most of the time we're going to use CVD because it's good enough for a hand analysis. It gets us close. It gets us within a few percent. Now, if I want to get the exact value, I can use the CVD technique, for example, to design a circuit. But then how do I go through and find out the exact values once I have figured out my design using this approximation? What do I do next? I use LT spice. That's what all engineers do, right? That's what designers do. You use hand techniques to get you close. And then you use a simulator to tune the design and figure out the exact values. So in this case, this is a standard design technique. We start with CVD for a first cut design. We then simulate for exact values. And that's what we're going to do in this class. We're going to always start with a simple hand analysis, and then you can tweak it and tune it using LT Spice. But I always want to warn people, never let LT Spice become a crutch. 
You always want to have an idea of what your answer is going to be from doing a hand analysis. One of the biggest errors I see students fall into, one of the biggest traps is they just sit there and they just start iterating numbers in LT Spice, just hoping that somewhere along the line the simulator will be smarter than they are and will actually tell them the answer. It doesn't work that way. Okay? The simulator is a tool, but it will not do your design for you. You've got to go through and think about it first and then have an idea of where you're going and then the, L the simulator lets you tune that. But if, if you literally try to design by randomly throwing numbers into a simulator, you're in for a very, very, very long homework session or a very long exam session or lab session or whatever. So watch out for this. Always keep in mind LT Spice is a tool. It's a brainless tool. You're the one with the brain. So make sure you use it intelligently. Okay, well, given the CVD approximation, this opens up a whole lot of other circuits we can easily and quickly solve. Let's, let's look at some other examples here. Let's look, for example, at this circuit. Okay, if I were to ask you, what is V out for this circuit, assuming those diodes are on? What's the answer? Using the CVD approximation? 2.1, exactly. If all these diodes are on, they've also got 0.7 volts across them. Add them together, 2.1 volts. The actual value will be slightly off, but that's a reasonable approximation. Now, in order for this to work, what do I know must be true about VDD? It's got to be not only positive, what else do we have to know it's got to be true about it? Greater than 2.1, right. In other words, it's got to be a large enough value to turn all those diodes on. So we note that VDD has got to be greater than or equal to 2.1 volts. So here we begin to see that the voltage you're trying to generate, clearly there are limits on the power supply, on the value of the voltage that's driving the circuit. Okay? Well now we see how to do this. Let's go back to the problem we were looking at the last lecture. Let's look at a simple, similar type of problem. Let's do this. Okay, I want to solve this circuit and I want to find I1, I2, VA, and VB. Uh, 
I'm going to do this using the CVD approximation for my diodes. Okay, I've got two diodes, and the diodes can be on or off. Now the question is, how do I figure out the state of those diodes? What do I do? Make an assumption, make a guess, check the assumptions, check the boundary conditions. This is no different than the ideal diode, except now when the diode is on, it's not zero volts, it's 0.7. But the technique is exactly the same. So let's make an assumption. Let's first assume D1 and D2 are on. So if D1 and D2 are on, that means I must have 0.7 volts. across both of those diodes if they're on. Not zero, but 0.7. And therefore, VA minus VB is 0.7 volts. Furthermore, I'm going to go through and define some current directions. Let's write a couple of KCL equations here. So 10 minus VB over 1K, this current, plus I1, is equal to VB over 2K. Furthermore, over here, Obviously, I2 and the current through that resistor are the same current. And so in this case, I will say that 10 minus VA over 5K is equal to I1 plus I2. And I2 is equal to, well, if this voltage is VA, what is that voltage at that node? VA minus 0.7, exactly, right? A little shortcut from circuits one. I'm just defining this. I mean, I could give it a different variable name, but why bother? I know there's a 0.7 volt, so I'm just going to label it that way, which means now this current I2 must be equal to, in this case, VA minus 0.7 plus 10, in other words, minus negative 10, plus 10 divided by 5K. Okay, what do I do at this point? Well, I can solve these. How would I solve these? What's a good way to solve these? Let's use Mathematica. Exactly. I mean, we could solve these simultaneously, but you have Mathematica, that's why it's on your desk, right? It gets you out of the drudgery here. Let's plug these into Mathematica and let's get a solution. And what we're going to get is the following. We're going to get that I1 is equal to minus 2.22 milliamps and I2 is equal to 3.04 milliamps. VA is equal to 5.89 volts, and VB is equal to 5.19 volts. Is there a problem with my assumption that I made before that both diodes are on? What is the problem? I1's negative, I1's negative exactly. This is not possible. We can't have a negative current through a diode. D1 has to be off. All right? So in this case, what is my next most reasonable guess to do my next iteration of this problem? 
what would I assume for my next time around? Yeah, let's assume D2 is on. There's nothing wrong with D2. I2 is positive. D2 is fine. But D1, let's assume that is off. So that is a very reasonable assumption to make. So let's assume D1 is off, D2 is on. And let's go through and let's recalculate. So in this case, let's go back to our circuit. Now I make this assumption. I1 is equal to 0. I don't know anything about the voltage across D1, but it better be negative when I check it. But I'm still assuming D2 is on, so I still have 0.7 volts. So now let's once again go through and let's write our KCL equations. So in this case, I1 is equal to 0. 10 minus VB over 1K is equal to 0 plus VB over 2K. And 10 minus VA over 5K is equal to 0 plus I2. And once again, I2 is equal to VA minus 0 0.7 plus 10, or I, should, I can just say minus negative 10 to be a bit more explicit, divided by... 5K, and once again I can solve. And if I solve now, what I will get is that VB is equal to 6.67 volts, VA is equal to 0 0.35 volts, and I2 is equal to 1.93 milliamps when I solve. Okay. Is D2 still on? Yeah, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with D2. But let's check the boundary condition on D1. So go and let's look at this. Okay, what is VA minus VB? VA minus VB, which is the voltage across the diode, okay, that's the voltage drop across the diode, is going to be equal to, in this case, 0 0.35 volts minus 6.67 volts. Is that a negative voltage? Yes. Therefore, D1 is reversed biased. It is therefore off. Yes? I was wondering, what if still off, exactly. It's got to be 0.7 or greater. If it's less than 0.7, it is still off. Okay. okay. Now, in this case, it's negative, so I know it's off, but you're correct. Actually, it just needs to be less than 0.7 volts for the CVD model for it to be off. So, yeah, if I want to be more explicit about it, as you correctly point out, I should really say this. Is it less than 0.7 volts? Because that's really the cutoff value for the CVD model. All right, good point, good point. All right, am I done? Is this the answer? Yeah, here's the answer right here. I check my answers, the boundary conditions all look good. There's no need for me to check any other cases. So I'm finished at this point. So as you can see, this is really not fundamentally different than the ideal diode analysis we did before, only now the threshold, instead of being 0 volts for the diode voltage, is 0.7 volts. All right. Questions about this? You're going to get a lot better at this as we go through the semester. We're going to be using the CVD assumption all the time because 
not only in diodes, but when we get to bipolar junction transistors, we'll also use it there as well. So you're going to get good at this. Have no fear. I'm, I'm going to move on for now, but you'll be back. We'll be back. Okay. Let's now move on to another topic. And this is, this topic basically revolves around one of the techniques that we're going to be using for the rest of the semester. And this is small signal analysis. This is going to be absolutely fundamental to everything you're going to do for the rest of the semester in this course. You're going to have to get good at it. So let's look at the idea of small signal analysis. And we're going to start simple by using a diode. Let's consider small signal analysis using a diode. And I'm going to first start by graphing out the diode voltage uh, current curve, which we've already seen before. Now I'm going to look at this in forward bias, because this is where this is important. Small signal analysis matters when the diode is turned on. A diode that's off is not interesting. So if I were to look at this thing, as we've already seen before, we're going to have a cut in voltage or a turn on voltage that we're going to assume is about 0.7 volts. But essentially what we're going to say here is at about 0.7 volts we start to have significant current flow goes very quickly up that exponential curve. Now if I were to take this and plot this curve over a large number of ID versus VD values, such that I was able to sketch out this nonlinear behavior, I would call this the large signal model. I would say this is a large signal plot. A VD versus ID. Where I'm plotting every value of ID versus VD over a wide range of values. So in general, when we plot large signal values, we're usually plotting a very large range of values, usually something that covers like over the entire range of the power supply for a particular circuit. So we get values all the way from zero to very large values, for example, for all the currents in the circuit. And the thing about a nonlinear model, when you're looking at both diodes and, as we're going to see later on, transistors, there is a very important characteristic of a large signal model or a large signal plot. What is that characteristic? What is that mathematical characteristic that's very obvious from looking at this? It's not linear. It's not linear, right? It's exponential, yes. Large signal models tend to be nonlinear. We will, we will see an occasional, for example, as we're going to see later on, breakdown in diodes is actually linear. But in most cases, what we're going to see when we look at diodes and transistors is the equations that describe how they behave are nonlinear equations. And you're going to see this over and over again. Well, there's only one problem with nonlinear models. They're hard to work with mathematically, right? Solving nonlinear equations is painful. 
You either have to make approximations or you have to use some kind of numerical method or simulator. But it's not the kind of thing you can tackle by hand. This is not something where you can do simple linear analysis like you did in 2112 where we assumed everything was linear. Okay. But if we think about it, even though the model itself is nonlinear, back in 2112, in 2112, we learned about linear circuit analysis, right? In fact, we all got really good at linear circuit analysis. Nodal analysis, Thevenin's theorem, all of the other theorems we learned all worked on the assumption that we were dealing with a linear circuit. Except now we're dealing with nonlinear circuits, so I guess we can just throw all that out the door, can't we? Well, no, we're not. We're not going to do that. This is what we're going to do instead. We know how to do linear circuit analysis. What we're going to do is we're going to create a small signal model which is a linear approximation of the large signal model. Why do we do it? We do small signal models because they're computationally easy for us to tackle. We know exactly how to do linear circuit analysis. What is the obvious trade-off of doing a small signal versus a large signal model when you're calculating values in a circuit? It's less accurate. Exactly. That's always the trade-off. You're trading off accuracy for simplicity of calculation. So a small signal model is less accurate, but it's still much easier to calculate with. And as we turn out, if we may, as long as we make reasonable assumptions, granted it's less accurate, but the accuracy typically may be on the owner of only a few percent error. So it's still pretty darn good, just, just as like we saw with the numerical when we did the CVD versus the exact iteration value. We're trading off accuracy, but if we're smart about it, the trade-off is not that great. Okay. So we're going to be looking at circuits where we care about the linear response of a circuit. And so we're going to be using this small signal model to calculate that linear response. Always keeping in mind that it's not completely accurate, but good enough. Okay. Now, before we start looking at small signal modeling and how it's going to work, first we have to define a term you're going to be hearing a lot for the rest of the semester. That's the concept of biasing. You will always hear this. You're biasing a circuit. What, is, what does bias mean? Bias means you are sitting the operating values of a circuit. You're deliberately sitting it at a particular operating point.
So in biasing, we're going to set a voltage and or current in a circuit somehow. We're going to set that voltage and current for a particular component like a diode or a transistor to specific DC values in order to place our circuit in a desired operating condition. So this is things that people do all the time. When you're designing a circuit, you want to make sure you're biasing it at the operating point that you want it to be at. Okay. So given this, I'm going to redraw that IDVD curve. Make it a little bit bigger here. So here's my curve of VD versus ID for that diode. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose an operating point for that diode. I'm going to bias that diode at a particular quiescent point. So I'm going to pick this value here. I call this IQ. call this VQ. So I'm going to say this combination of VQ and IQ on this curve for this diode is the bias point or the quiescent point. Or you'll hear it called sometimes the DC point. They all mean the same thing. This is the operating point that you are sitting the circuit to. Now, let's look at this curve here. And what I want you guys to do is I want you to imagine that we were to take this portion of the curve here and we were to blow up that portion of the curve, magnify that. So let's do that. Let's take this and let's magnify it. And I magnify it. It looks like this. Okay, along that small section of the curve, what does that look reasonably like to you? It looks linear. Doesn't that look like a straight line over a tiny segment? Yeah, exactly. Over the entire curve, it's clearly nonlinear, but if I'm just to take a small chunk out of that curve and blow it up, it is a close approximation to a line, to a linear approximation. Okay, now you begin to see what we're doing here with our small signal model. We're going to focus on a piece of this curve to the point where if it's small enough, it looks linear, looks reasonably linear. So here we have something that is approximately linear. Not perfectly, but close enough, within a few percent. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to assume that I'm going to, on top of this DC operating condition, I'm going to superimpose an AC signal on top of the DC voltage. So I'm going to assume, for example, that I'll have this kind of behavior. I'm going to assume there's an AC signal, a small, a small change, a small AC signal riding on top of that DC voltage. And over here, I'm going to see a corresponding AC signal on top of the diode current that corresponds to that shift in the DC point, the, the voltage across the diode. As long as I do not, as long as these AC signals are not too large, 
they're going to operate over a portion of this, over this curve here that looks reasonably linear, which means we can treat this using linear circuit analysis. So that's the trick. That is what small signal analysis does for you. So what we find is this. If the AC signals are much smaller than the DC voltages and currents in the circuit, then we find that the response in the circuit will be approximately linear. The behavior will be approximately linear. So here's what we have to have. The AC signals have to be much smaller than the DC voltages and the DC currents. So this AC DC voltage, this, this, pardon me, this AC voltage has to be much smaller than the DC quiescent voltage. This AC current has to be much smaller in amplitude than the DC current. But as long as that's true, over a small range of that nonlinear response, it'll look reasonably linear. And therefore, everything we learned in 2112 becomes valid again. All right. This leads to something we call the small signal approximation. According to the small signal approximation, this is kind of a rule of thumb, but typically the small signal approximation says as long as your AC voltages have amplitudes of 5 millivolts or less, you can pretty much treat this circuit as if it's linear. So we're assuming a linear behavior, a linear approximation, as, soon, as long as the AC value is small. Okay? Uh, some textbooks will give you different values for the approximation. Some will say, oh, 10 millivolts, or, or some, some will say less. It all depends. But it all comes down to the fact that you want the AC voltage to be much smaller than the DC voltages in your circuit. And so typically, this is kind of the rule of thumb our textbook uses. Okay. Now, what this says is if this is true, we get a very linear response. Quite accurate. Not perfectly, but quite accurate. But let me ask you a question. What if we violate this approximation? What if our AC amplitudes violate that 5 millivolt limit? What if we build an amplifier circuit and the AC value of the output of the amplifier circuit is a volt and the, power so and the circuit itself has a 5 volt power supply? Does that mean that the small signal approximation just goes out the window and it's totally useless to us? Not at all. What happens if the amplitudes violate that limit? 
what, what, what happens? Does, does the small signal analysis stop working completely? No. What does happen? Does it just become less accurate? It becomes less accurate. Exactly. That's exactly what happens. So it's not that it is useless if we exceed this limit of 5 millivolts. What happens is we lose accuracy. But the technique is still very useful. Now the thing to remember about small signal analysis is just as we talked about with CVD, with the CVD model, it is quick and easy to use, but it is not as accurate as the ideal as the, as the true behavior of the circuit. So if I do a calculation with small signal analysis and I want to find out how the circuit really works, what do I do? I simulate it for the LT spice. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we're going to do. Okay, so let me plot out to you guys before we go what it is you're going to be doing in this class for the rest of the semester. <laughs> and I'm not kidding about that. You're going to be doing this for the rest of the semester. We're going to start with a large signal model. So we're going to have large signal equations that describe how a circuit works, circuits that include diodes and transistors. We're going to apply DC sources to the circuit to turn it on and to set a bias point. Now from the output of this, we're going to get what we call our Q point, our quiescent point. As we're going to see, we need those Q point values because those Q point values are going to then feed into our small signal model. The values of the small signal model will depend upon the quiescent values, the quiescent DC values. At this point, we're going to have AC inputs. We're going to put those into our small signal model. When I say AC inputs, what I talk about? Voice, music, sound, data, okay? The things we care about when we build circuits like amplifiers and stuff like that. And then what's the result going to be? AC outputs, some kind of voltage or current. In essence, this is how you design an amplifier or any other type of circuit we're going to look at this semester. You're all going to get very good at this. And guess what? When you're over here, what you're doing? EECE 2112. So remember I told you guys that like 80% of this class or 90% is circuits one? That's exactly what it is. I will give you the large signal models. I'm going to give you all the equations. So they'll be right there in front of you in the exams. But you've got to correctly do the calculations and then apply the small signal model in order to get your answers. Okay, you're going, to, you're going to get really used to this before the semester is over. You're all going to be experts at it, all right? Okay, guys, have a good weekend. Next time we'll come and we will look at the actual small signal model for a diode, derive that, and then start to do calculations with it.